Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. And welcome to this week's episode of the Market Pulse Pros and Pioneers podcast. Each week we're joined by a guest who's either a business owner, a marketing expert, somebody who's neither, or a bit of bore. And I think today, if I'm reading my cards right, Julian, who's joining us today, is, is actually a little bit of both. So thank you very much for coming along to the show, Julian. Hope you're well. Hi there. Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. No problem at all. Yeah, looking at Julian, looking at your background, Julian, I can see you, you put yourself down as a business owner with the agency store. But as I like to say, like most entrepreneurs are natural marketers. They just don't realize it. Um, and as somebody who's worked with a few different businesses, you've worked in finance, you've worked in branding, you've probably got quite a good understanding of marketing in the background as well. And currently interested in building out a product around AI, if I'm not wrong. That's so, right, yeah. Before we get on to that, I'm gonna I'm gonna break out the the fun fact for everyone, which is, and I love this, is you actually just enjoy making things up as you go along. I wish more people would. That's right. I think it's making things up as you go along. Yeah, it's I guess it's a musical analogy. I like blues and jazz and that sort of thing. Improvising, it's always amazing to see what can be created in the spur of the moment. Not to say that. Classical music or sort of composition is a bad thing, but um, I think that bit of energy that comes with improvising, uh, you know, it's a great thing to bring into business, into work, spontaneity, things on your feet, that sort of thing. Um, I think a lot of marketing is about that because uh, if there were magic formulas that you could just sort of rely on 100%, then everyone would do. Marketing is all about creativity, I think. Yeah, it's one of the things I love saying to people is quite often people come to me and they, and they expect me to have the golden bullet. There, There isn't a golden bullet. It's just blood, sweat, tears, iteration, trial and error, and making more mistakes than most of the people so that you figure out what actually does work. I think if you're afraid to try and afraid to fail, then you'll never find out what truly does work. And that's why I love about making it up. It's, I think it was Richard Branson that, that said it in the book long ago. Just say yes, figure the rest out as you go. I'm not going to make any political remarks. I'm going, to, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to leave my political hat off. So I guess if you would be so Definitely. kind, um, yeah. just to share a bit of your background, how did you get where you are, Julian? I think it started when I finished uh, a degree, which back when you could do degrees and they'd pay you to do degrees, was quite some time ago. And probably because of that, I hadn't really got a plan for what I was going to do with it. I ended up with my like a degree in linguistics and philosophy, which I then discovered is like totally useless. And what are they going to do now? Uh, basically, immediately retrained as an accountant, which was like the other end of the scale altogether, and got into finance. I think I might have panicked, maybe. And I just thought, how I need to like safeguard getting paid. So I'll become an accountant because that because they always seem to be in demand. I'm going to finance, but I think probably in the sort of toing and froing of your, your own story, got a bit bored of finance and then went into branding. So I worked in a big branding firm and learned a lot about kind of brands and people that do branding and companies that need branding. And I was fortunate enough that the firm I worked for, Interbrand, was, had uh, a lot of global clients. So there's a lot of travel involved. Well, there's a huge amount of travel involved, and they've got the, they've got the privilege, really, to go around the world a lot and see a lot of different companies, a lot of cultures, a lot of places. And uh, that really helped me, again, see a lot of different perspectives on things. But in the end, I grew a bit tired of branding, and I spent a couple of years at a charity doing essentially a marketing role. I think I was responsible for all the income and the fundraising. And it was interesting then because I realized that just by rebranding, you aren't going to help anymore. You're, you've actually got to fix a lot more than just the branding. 
and yeah. understood about kind of teams and operations and technology and budgeting and getting things in the right order. And with it being a charity, actually, you, you have this moral purpose almost, which is you can't take huge risks because it's not really your money. And I've always been really impressed with charity marketeers, charity fundraisers. They have an insane, not insane, but like a very high level of focus on ROI. Like they essentially take money out of the charity, they deploy it, but they absolutely have to bring back more than they take it out. And it was interesting because in the for-profit world, a lot of marketeers would talk about their obsession with ROI. But it, in reality, it was nowhere near, they were nowhere near as obsessed as for uh, non-profit marketers. So that was a good education, but eventually I installed some people who were better at it than I was. And being a bit of a consultant, I left and went even smaller and basically became a sort of person with a laptop and did some sort of on-the-fly sort of manager of consulting for different businesses, really bringing everything together. So it was like... Um, Branding and marketing strategy mm. in the business case. So there's a bit of accounting, branding, you know, making stuff happen. And eventually fell into research because I was using a lot of research and joined a small group of people who built a research agency from about five people. It's now about 650 people. And over about five or six years, scaled that business. And, and then, yeah, latterly, again, left that big animal to some more capable managers went small again and my sort of current project is as you say gained ai and we've launched a, product, a product called pitchpower.ai which is about really taking the weight out of new business for agencies and people service for people that use proposals people that do pitching and that was always the big problem whether it was at Interbrand or at Savanta, the research firm, the cost of new business was, is just so high. And the simple facts are that a decent proposal might take three or four people several days to do, but the average win rate's about one in three. Automatically, the cost of new business is extraordinarily high. And so AI is really good at drawing the, drawing the dots and making stuff that sounds good and that's often what a lot of proposals are. Pitch Power is a fully self-service product. People log on, they load themselves up, they can find leads, they can generate proposals, they can do a whole lot of stuff. And that's about nine or 10 months old now. We've got like six and a half thousand users on there and I'm learning new stuff every day. But I guess the beauty of that is it's the first time I've ever had a business where I'm really hands off. It's been the full arc of the story. So exciting times and definitely something about marketing there because there's a whole load of AI products. There's a whole load of challenges around marketing AI. And Pitch Power is itself a way that small firms can improve their marketing as well. So it's very much looking to learn from small businesses in terms of what they need, what they want. And every day we talk to someone. And they'll tell us something new about how they go to market or what their marketing challenges are. And yeah. we try as best we can just to put it onto the feature roadmap and implement it as fast as possible and then tell them that's what we've done. That's insanely interesting. I like that. It's finally being able to apply that data-oriented approach to building a proposal. So not just traditionally, like if I think back to everybody does, when you first start a business, you set off with an idea and you think that, that idea is going to be the thing that you do all the time. That's going to be your business. What else were you going to do with your time? And then they actually realize you've got to be a salesperson. You've got to be a marketeer. You've got to be in a financial controller. You've got to be a financial director. You've got investors to worry about. You've got pre-seed and seed rounds and things like that. If you're in SaaS, it doesn't go in business. And all of a sudden you end up doing so many things and very little of your time spent on doing that one thing that you love that you really wanted to do more of in the first place. And for me, I'm a big fan of AI in, in the right places to help support, get business owners back to doing what they're supposed to be doing in the first place, which isn't, let's be honest, building a proposal. If you're fortunate enough to be good at building proposals, and there's lots of us out there yeah. who are terrible at building proposals, mine look awful. So I'll be checking out 
I'll be decking out pitch power after we get off the call because anything that can make that look sexy or help me build it in a way that's more likely to convert customers, why wouldn't I be using that? Yeah, yeah. let me rustle up a voucher code and mm. put it in the, uh, the end comments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do it, do it. Ping me, a, ping me a voucher code over. We'll put it in the uh, the podcast notes and we'll uh, we'll we'll give that access to people. So I yeah, guess. There. Go on. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you're right. Go on. I just I, part of it is exactly that, which is if you're small and um, or there's a few of you or you're really passionate about something, there's such a a waste associated with the new business that it's it doesn't even have any sort of sentimental value. There's learnings that come out of writing proposals that you don't win. But oftentimes it's just a question of numbers and it really does detract from what's available to do our quality work and to do our quality stuff. If you're literally spending like days and days putting together quite complicated bespoke documents that often don't really get the full light of day. So it's an odd form of loss that we've grown used to, but in a way, I think it's we're getting more integrated. We've swapped out hit and hope advertising for more programmatic social media advertising, performance marketing, etc. And I think it's only a matter of time before we look at the other forms of marketing that we have and, and start to put the ruler against it and say that there's a huge amount of waste in there uh, and we could be using this time more productively elsewhere. Because I think that's the general trend is looking at the opportunity cost of time right. as we end up more i feel like since lockdown time has become much more precious we're expected to do more quick always be available etc so a lot of that kind of space in between events isn't there and so recovering it becomes more valuable and certainly not wasting it on things where you know you're already preloading the gun to accept yeah. that if I've got some people working in new business, then actually like almost two thirds of their time is wasted, yeah. which is a hard thing to accept as an alternative. Yeah, I, I, I get it. To, to talk about the platform for a moment in, in terms of the, the six and a half thousand years, because that's an incredible success to have had over 10 months. What would you say the secret is to finding that six and a half thousand customers? What primary channels have you used to drive that forward? Hi, and thanks for joining us for the show. I'm Paul, founder here at Javelin Content Management. We specialize in getting ideas out of your head, down into video, and out to your social media through repurposing and efficient content strategies. If you want to find out how you can convert your ideal audience into paying customers, reach out to us, javelincontent.com, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. I think, I think there's a number of things. I won't say we've done a huge amount of paid marketing. I think we have been fortunate with word of mouth a lot. So when you see a sort of flurry of new users join the platform, we get some information about them, like where they're based, et cetera. And it's interesting because it might be that there's like three people from Spain join. And then all of a sudden, the 10 people from Spain join. Yeah. And then someone from Australia joins. And then there's 10 Australians and some New Zealanders. And then someone from Los Angeles joins. And then there's someone. So I, I, I get the feeling that users are coming along and going, oh, this is amazing. I should tell my mates. And then that's bringing the next wave on. So we've been super fortunate with word of mouth. I think a big thing about AI is that it is still quite divisive. I think people are a little bit afraid of it, possibly rightly, in certain settings. So where we have bore marketing, we've generally bought it where there is an AI enthusiast element to it. So it could be like AI newsletters just to filter out that kind of initial reason to reject. A lot of the 6,000 would be early adopters. So that they're early adopters of newness, but they're also non-rejectors of AI. Yeah. They have newness and AI put together. So that was like an initial decision. But I think as the customers have got sort of slightly bigger from freelancers into some small agencies, and we've even had global consulting firms. One was like a 
the chief of staff of a global bank and even got in touch because he has investment people who do these pitch decks and they take ages to make and et cetera. But the bigger the organization, actually, the more in the end, AI becomes a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So for us, you know, we, we've had to think about how do we train in our focus so that we can still have relatively efficient new business without kind of having a sort of heart says yes, head says no. And that's just about like learning where she's spot in the market at this point in time. So yeah, so I think picking the right pools to fish in and uh, building something that um, generates word of mouth has been probably the two main important things for us. I think that's really interesting in that uh, some of it was intended, but then there's been a lot of unintended side effects of kind of champions finding the technology and then spreading it amongst their community. And I subscribe a lot to the words of Chris Walker when he talks about dark yeah. social and the power of dark social. Everybody thinks that's, oh, I've posted 10 times this week that dark social because somebody views that and then buys yeah. my product. And it is, but then there's also the element of SAP networking groups, Facebook groups, all these other things that you can't possibly hope to conquer as such as a business. You, you're lucky yeah, if you yeah. have a champion who's part of those groups, but actively targeting that sort of thing is it has an interesting effect in terms of an accessible technology like yours, where it's not a, you know, it's not a complex technology. It's not a, it's not a high ticket item. It's something that's affordable by most businesses. Therefore, how do you get it out there the quickest? And that's a really interesting way of leveraging that dark social content, I think. The big thing that we've discovered, which we didn't expect to discover, actually was the diversity of the customers. We had in mind holding up the mirror and it would be like, oh, it's going to be marketing services agencies, basically, or marketing freelancer type people. And it was just fascinating that really quite early on, we realized that we had like voice coaches, independent financial advisors, recruitment consultants. We had solar panel installers. We had celebrity, celebrity, I don't know what, even, what they did, but they were like since people that kind of rebrand celebrities on a one-to-one -one basis. They also do proposals for some reason. The people were using it for all sorts of things, like taking the kind of basic architecture of the, of the product, which is who are you, who do you want to work with? and like some kind of a concept of a brief and then clashing the three together and creating a proposal in a format that you can control, choose. So it comes out in the right shape and length, has the right topics in it. That there were lots of people who were basically using it to, to apply to university. Realize or expect that they were loading themselves up into it and then they were putting university URLs as prospects and then working out like how they should best write their cover note that would explain why they would be eligible to be on a certain course. That's fantastic. And then pressing publish and out comes their sort of application form. And therefore hit so it and was like a real and oh there's all sorts of yeah. things. And we had oh the only other company that's got a commercial license to make reusable rockets in the US, so there's Elon Musk and there's this other person. So we had the other person. And he, <laughs> he was using pitch power to propose recyclable rockets to various people. So it was really interesting. And that, that was inspiring because I've worked in businesses before, and I think probably many of the listeners will, will recognize this, that you, there, there is a very strong bias inside all organizations, which is like what we do, like what we want to do and trying to persuade other people to help you do what you want to do. Will you buy my flowers or will you come in my restaurant? And I really didn't want to make that mistake. So I wrote into the developer who's experienced in making these very like quick quickly adopted products, we had to keep a very open mind about kind of what is this product? Who is it for? What does it do? And just make sure that we were really led by customers and their use cases and their pain points and what they wanted next and let them guide us in a way. And that's been so much more successful than 
things I've been involved with where we've got a very fixed idea of what we want to make. Mm-hmm. And it's, we're going to take this to market and then we're going to brief some marketeers about how do we sell this? What's our key messages? Like, how do we get people to believe these things? And I just noticed the the whole mindset of how much force you're going to have to bring to bear to reach your goals if you've already decided what it is that you want to do and yeah. um, you've already set uh, a course about how do I convince everyone else? It's so much harder and slower than actually asking the question quite genuinely, like what do people want you to do? How do they see the problem? What words do they use to describe the solution? And then it feels quite obvious, but then what you have to do is make that thing and describe it in their terms and then let them know about it. And they just seem to say, yeah, that's my problem. Actually, you've, you've developed something that seems to sound just like my problem. So what do I do? You, right? I click on this link and I sign up. That sounds yeah. great. And so it's, I think it's to do with how flexible you can be, how uncomfortable maybe you can be with giving that control to your customers to let them decide what your roadmap's going to be. It's not always possible. You can't do that if you're the NHS. But certainly with small businesses, I think just trying to reflect what people want and what people sound like and how they talk and how they call things out and the words they use and all that sort of stuff. What logically comes next for them is going to be so much easier than trying to get them to rethink the whole world the way you see it. In fact, it's probably impossible unless you've got, you know, lots and lots of money. That all makes that all makes sense. I love I love the idea of just getting back to the basics of being able to talk your customers' language, right? But being brave enough to see it from their perspective. And I love the power of that. I guess the, the other side of the bench then is, it sounds like you guys have had some incredible success. And with incredible success comes some interesting failures and challenges. So is there anything out there that you've tried and tested and you just found that it just either didn't do what it said on the tin or it's not for you guys? Is it something that you've wasted your time and effort on? Yeah. Yeah. The business that I set up before Pitch Power was, I would say, an absolute failure where the only good thing that came out of it was a lot of lessons about what not to do. And hopefully they're going to be like more valuable than the losses over the, into the future. But this was really a kind of an idea for a flexible talent marketplace, which was based for joining together some buyers and sellers of kind of market research, insight, analytics. So, um, and it was at that time, just after the start of the pandemic, where I think like flexible working almost presented itself like AI, you know, like gig economy, everyone's going to be in the gig economy. Like it's the end of the career. It's all about getting on portfolio careers uh, and such. up work or bike or something. And if you don't want to do that, then ride a bike for delivery. Um, all the valuations were really high and the business model seemed quite obvious. It was just about picking a niche, getting enough supply and demand, building a kind of platform where people can go on search, find someone, book, interact, pay, schedule, all that sort of stuff. And the template seemed, wasn't about the template. It was more about, can you find this sub niche where these two groups have got no way of connecting, but they really want to. And it all just went wrong because we spent so much money on technology. We, we spent it through a development process that was really old fashioned, it was really expensive, it was really slow. It was very architectural. So it was like, this is a picture of the shard. We're going to build the shard over the next three years, floor by floor. It wasn't reacting to what was going on. And the shard isn't the shard until the shard's finished. So it was basically like nothing. So no one could demo it, no one could try it out. Meanwhile, we're just spending all the money. And, and so we tried to leap from the situation by making it into a sort of managed service so that we kind of hold the hand of the customer, the vendors, make transactions happen. And then it became obvious that they didn't really want to work this way anyway. And as soon as they could, they'd just go back to WhatsApp because it was just more convenient. It suited the way that they wanted to work. They really wanted to log in and do all this stuff and then pay 20% and they can't change the contract. 
And I was just like, yeah, I just, I didn't really think that I needed to ask the audience as much as I actually needed to ask the audience. I thought I'd done that bit up front. And now I just got the blueprints of it. The calendars need to get the builders in, need to start building, and it's all going to be fine. And actually, I think the key thing was the underlying sort of desire for that service to exist just wasn't there. I think um, there's, which there's meant probably that something no one could really understand of, what it was. I think it's, there's, there's probably something in there along. Sometimes people will tell you that they want something because it sounds like a really good idea. But actually, when you put it to them on a silver platter, it's not what they needed and therefore they don't use it. And I think that's really, yeah. that's really hard to research and analyze because, if you, again, the only people you can ask is the end user and they're telling you they want it. But actually, yeah. is it what they need? And sometimes the two diverge. And I think that's yes. it's a painful lesson. But yeah. yeah, completely agree. I think that it's a real challenge like within any sort of entrepreneurial situation to be really careful about this. Like there will be problems in every market and there could be like an innovative solution to that problem. But the extra problem that comes with the new solution is the fact that it's new. And the whole idea of newness basically can be swapped out for the idea of change. Yeah. And the only thing we know about change is that no one likes change. And people will go, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be amazing if, yeah, I hate that. But then when it comes up, oh, yeah, yeah, but that's new and unfamiliar. And this is not good, but it's familiar. And I know it's going to happen. And it might be that's inefficient. That's bloody cool. By, you know, busy. Yeah, yeah. And I think, John, people often hold up Apple as being like, how do they manage to get some newness out there? And I still think it is in plain sight, like the answer. They have this idea of intuitive products it's intuitive and what they have this idea of intuitive and then think different and actually what intuitive really means is don't think different because it means it, everything is where you expect it to be it works how you expect it to work like it works in the way that it should work yeah in your view which means that there's actually no need for any new thinking yeah. Because it's all intuitive. It's all, of course, that happens. That's where it should be. And I press this button and that. And um, it's the great trick, I think, of Apple is that they make the new feel like the old. Yeah. And if you can do that, then you'll be really successful. But never try and make the new feel like the new. Yeah. Because that's when Cause it's you have a lot of you, heads right? going, yes, but then Shams not doing anything. So I think that's been my big learning is, is in... And it's wrapped up with listening to Pete Waller, like describing things in their own way, but try to limit the amount of newness yep. in, in both. And as much as possible, make things feel like they're part of what they're comfortable with, what they've already known, all makes sense. Um, because if you go to market with newness, you just get this newness has changed. Yep. And then you've got another thing to overcome another set of pushback it's fantastic i've really enjoyed the conversation julian there's lots of bits and pieces to pull out there and i think we could probably have chatted for much longer done things in a lot more detail so absolutely welcome to come back for another show at some point and we can delve into and find out how pitch power is getting on further down the line as well it'd be fascinating to see how yeah. you guys are doing and how that evolves over time if anybody wants to reach out and chat about anything on the show today julian how do they best reach you i'm on linkedin and um... More than more than welcome to get in touch that way, or you can email me, uh, Julian at pitchpower.ai, if you'd like to do that. And I think that's probably the, one of the two best ways. And as I said, I'll put a voucher code in the chat. Pitchpower is really not designed to be expensive. I think it's nine dollars a month, and, and there's no contract, no commitment. So, a voucher code for a month for free. People want to try it. Give it a go, see if they like it. I'm really more interested in people, hearing people's feedback, actually, mm -hmm. than the $19. Yeah. Um, if you use any users want to jump me up, get in touch. Yeah. There you go. The first, yeah, that's uh, right. If someone's overusing it, I, over the moon. The first Market Pulse Pros and Pioneers product advertisement, by all means, give it a try, but on the proviso that you must be fair to Julian and give him some feedback and have a chat with him. I love that. 
what a, what a fantastic proposal. Yeah. Julian, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if you've enjoyed the episode, um, we're here every Wednesday at 3 p.m. British summertime until it's autumn, which I don't think it's that far away anymore. Um, summer was late starting here in the UK, so we're, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably have about three weeks of it and then it'll be autumn again. Um, welcome to the rain. So yeah, join us next week for another episode of Market Pulse, three o'clock Wednesdays. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specialize in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.